ever feel like uh you need a law degree just to understand like the news these days? Right. Well, today's deep dive is for anyone who's ever thought what was really going on with all those attempts to challenge the 2020 election. We're diving into this legal document, and let me tell you, it lays out some pretty jaw-dropping allegations. It's like a political thriller, honestly. Oh, tell me about it. We're talking about alleged pressure campaigns, accusations of fraud, and even a potential link to the January 6th Capitol attack. And it all revolves around this one document that reads like a who's who of the Trump administration. And full disclosure, this document is definitely coming from one side of the argument. Mm. But trust me, the details are wild. We're going to break down the most shocking bits and connect the dots across multiple states so you get the full picture. Think of it this way. Imagine a friend, you know, someone who's a legal eagle, summarizing this document just for you, pointing out the most important arguments and evidence, but without all the legal jargon. Okay, so buckle up. This isn't just about one state's election results. We're talking Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, the whole shebang. And what's fascinating is how this document lays out a timeline. We're not just talking about random events. It connects actions, statements, even tweets to show a potential pattern of behavior. Like they're saying, this wasn't just a coincidence, folks. Here's the playbook. Exactly. And one of their boldest claims, they argue that presidential immunity shouldn't apply to the actions they describe in this document. Okay, pause for a sec. For those of us who uh, didn't go to law school, what does that even mean? Essentially, presidential immunity protects the president from being sued for things they do while in office. But this document is saying, hold on, trying to overturn an election, that's not part of the job description, so immunity shouldn't shield you. So they're going for the jugular here. Mm -hmm. Let's get into the nitty gritty. One event that immediately comes to mind is that infamous phone call between Trump and Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. Remember that one? Oh, absolutely. That call is a prime example of how this document operates. They use very specific moments, even direct quotes, to build their case. For example, they highlight when Trump says, I just want to find 11,780 votes. It's straight out of a movie. Yeah. They also talk about those Arizona lawmakers who were allegedly being harassed at their homes, people with bullhorns, even someone with a gun. Yeah. That's intense. And that's the point they're trying to drive home. This wasn't just political disagreement. The document argues that these alleged actions created a climate of fear and intimidation. And to make things even wilder, they bring up Rudy Giuliani. They claim even Trump's own team was getting frustrated with his claims about election fraud. One staffer allegedly said, it's all just conspiracy expletive beamed down from the mothership. That's right. And by including these internal criticisms, they're trying to show that maybe even Trump's closest allies had doubts about what was going on. It's like a peek behind the curtain of the campaign. So it's not just about Rudy's, like, outlandish claims, right? <laughs> this document tries to tie it all back to January 6th, claiming it wasn't just some random outburst. Uh, that's a crucial point. They're arguing that the January 6th attack on the Capitol wasn't a spontaneous event, but rather the culmination of this alleged strategy we've been talking about, this attempt to overturn the election results. Okay, so they're saying it was all connected. Give us some more of those, like, behind-the-scenes details. What else does this document focus on? Well, they spent a lot of time on the pressure allegedly put on state level officials, like that phone call with Georgia's Secretary of State Raffensperger that we just talked about. That wasn't the only time they were in touch. This document claims there were tons of calls, tweets and even lawsuits all aimed at Georgia. It sounds like they were really feeling the heat. But were these tactics limited to Georgia? Not at all. The document claims similar things happened in other states, too. For example, they describe a phone call where Trump and his lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, allegedly urged Arizona House Speaker Rusty Bowers to use claims of fraud to decertify Arizona's election results. Right, seriously. Even though there wasn't much evidence. That's what's wild. According to this document, Bowers kept asking for proof, but Giuliani allegedly said something like, we don't have the evidence, but we have lots of theories. Theories. That doesn't exactly inspire confidence. Right. And remember those Arizona lawmakers who were allegedly harassed. The document claims Bowers was one of them. They're suggesting this is an example of what happened when officials didn't go along with these demands. OK, so we got Arizona. We've got Georgia. What about the other swing states? The document claims similar pressure tactics were used in Michigan. They even allege that Trump tried to invite Michigan lawmakers to the White House in an attempt to sway them. Talk about using the office to your advantage. Did it work? Not according to the document. They claim those lawmakers said they hadn't seen any evidence of widespread fraud. 
So it sounds like this document is trying to build a case that Trump and his allies were pushing these claims even when they knew they might not be true. That's one interpretation, yes. And the document doesn't stop there. It goes on to suggest that this alleged pressure campaign ultimately culminated in the events of January 6th with Vice President Mike Pence at the center of it all. Okay, so remind us, why was Pence such a target? What did they want him to do? They wanted him to reject the electoral votes from certain states, basically to declare Trump the winner even though he'd lost the election. But Pence didn't have the power to do that, did he? Exactly. The Constitution is pretty clear about the vice president's role in counting electoral votes. It's largely ceremonial. They don't have the authority to just toss out votes they don't like. So they were asking Pence to break the law. That's a bold move. The document goes even further, claiming that some of Trump's advisors actually drafted a plan for how Pence could pull it off. They even include excerpts from a memo allegedly written by one of Trump's lawyers, John Eastman, which outlines the strategy. Wait, hold up. Who's John Eastman, and why should we care about his memo? Eastman was a legal scholar and a conservative legal activist. He became an advisor to Trump during the election challenges. This memo is important because it shows that there was a plan, at least on paper, for how Pence could potentially overturn the election. Okay, so they were seriously considering this. But we all know how it ended, right? With a mob of angry protesters storming the Capitol, chanting, Hang Mike Pence. It's pretty wild to think how close we came to a full-blown constitutional crisis. Absolutely chilling. It definitely makes you think about how fragile democracy really is. For sure. This document paints a pretty intense picture with allegations of pressure campaigns, attempts to overturn election results, and ultimately a potential link to the violence at the Capitol. Mm. But we've got to remember, this is just one side of a very complicated story. What other angles should we be considering? Well, for starters, this document really focuses on Trump's actions and words. But what about the role of social media in all of this? Social media was like this whole other battleground during the 2020 election. And this document is full of examples of how Trump used Twitter to, you know, get his message out there. Yeah, it's a fascinating, but also like kind of a scary example of how social media can be used to influence people, spread information or misinformation, and, you know, even potentially incite violence. And th this document isn't letting social media off the hook. They're arguing that Trump's tweets weren't just like random thoughts he was firing off, you know? Yeah. They were part of a strategy to create doubt about the election and stir things up. Right. They're saying those tweets were calculated. Like, look at how he used Twitter to attack his opponents, question the legitimacy of the election process, and even put pressure on state officials. And it seemed like he was tweeting these things even when his own advisors were telling him there wasn't evidence of widespread fraud. That's what's really interesting. The document highlights those contradictions suggesting that Trump might have been aware that some of his claims weren't, you know, completely accurate. It's crazy to think about how many people were following his every word on Twitter. And some of those people ended up showing up at those state capitals, armed and angry, fueled by what they were reading online. It raises important questions about the influence of social media, doesn't it? Where do we draw the line between freedom of speech and using these platforms to spread potentially harmful misinformation? For sure. It's a conversation that's still going on today. But before we get too far down that rabbit hole, I want to circle back to something we talked about earlier. This whole idea that Trump shouldn't be protected by presidential immunity. Can you break that down for us one more time? It feels like a big deal. It is a big deal. Basically, presidential immunity is supposed to shield the president from lawsuits related to, you know, their official duties, the things they do as part of their job. But this document argues that Trump's actions crossed a line. So what are they basing that on? They say his actions weren't official acts of a president carrying out his duties. They were motivated by his personal desire to stay in power, even if it meant bending or breaking the rules. They point to things like the timing of his actions, what he was saying in those phone calls and tweets, and the fact that he often went against the advice of his own advisors. So it wasn't just about doing his job. It was about holding on to power no matter what. That's their argument. They even claim that by pressuring officials like Raffensperger to, quote, fine votes, he was acting more like a candidate desperately trying to win than a president upholding the Constitution. It's kind of mind blowing when you think about it that way. But at the end of the day, this is just one legal document, right? It is a specific point of view. Exactly. It's a compelling story for sure. But it's important to remember this is just one side of a very complex issue. 
There are other legal arguments, ongoing investigations, and different perspectives out there. It's like trying to put together a puzzle, but we only have half the pieces. And that's what makes these deep dives so fascinating, right? We're digging into these complex issues, examining the evidence, and trying to make sense of it all. But there are always more layers to uncover. Absolutely. So to our listeners, if you're intrigued by this whole thing, we highly recommend checking out the full document. We'll uh, link to it in the show notes. It's a long read, but trust me, it's worth it. It gives you a glimpse into the inner workings of power and the lengths some people might go to to hold on to it. And that's something worth thinking about. No matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, this story raises important questions about our democracy, the peaceful transfer of power, and the role of social media in our society. Heavy stuff. Hmm. But that's the beauty of the deep dive. We provide the information, but you get to draw your own conclusions. Until next time... Keep those minds curious and keep asking the tough questions.